Muito bem, muito boa tarde a todos novamente e bem-vindos ao quarto e último webinar da Upstream Innovation Week, promovida pelo Pacto Português para os Plásticos. À semelhança das sessões desta semana, a sessão de hoje é composta por uma apresentação do orador, que é seguida de um período de perguntas e respostas. Nesta parte, os participantes poderão colocar as questões ao orador. Os vossos microfones encontram-se desativados, sendo ativados para os participantes que pretendam colocar questões no período de perguntas e respostas. Para solicitar a vossa participação oral, por favor escrevam questão na funcionalidade do bate-papo e caso prefiram, poderão colocar as questões por escrito também através da mesma funcionalidade. À semelhança das outras sessões, hoje também será a apresentação em inglês. No futuro não muito distante, de facto já em julho de 2021, vamos deixar de poder utilizar alguns plásticos descartáveis, como os talheres, pratos ou palhinhas. Estes serão os resultados da implementação, em Portugal, da nova Diretiva 904 de 2019 da Comissão Europeia, que tem como objetivo prevenir e reduzir o impacto de determinados produtos de plástico no ambiente, mais particularmente no meio aquático e na saúde humana, estimulando a transição para uma economia circular. Mas, talvez existam soluções sustentáveis para os descartáveis. De facto, esta é a missão da Vejo Air desde 2006, uma empresa dedicada à produção de descartáveis e materiais biodegradáveis. Os produtos da Vejo Air, talheres, pratos, copos e recipientes descartáveis são feitos à base de plantas, utilizando materiais renováveis com baixa emissão de carbono, reciclados ou recuperados e projetados para serem comercialmente compostáveis com os resíduos de alimentos. Estas inovações compostáveis são soluções práticas para os descartáveis contaminados com alimentos, contribuindo para que o setor alimentar opere de forma mais sustentável. Na sessão de hoje da Upstream Innovation Week, intitulada Material Circulation Bioplastic Composting, a Lucy Frankel vai nos apresentar o caso da Vejoer e como esta empresa, através da inovação, tem criado descartáveis sustentáveis. Lucy, thank you very much for joining us today and uh, I'll pass on to you for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I would like to thank, uh, thank you very much to Smart Waste Portugal for the invitation. Whilst I do this, I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Excuse me for a moment. Um, so I'm very pleased to say happy Christmas, happy new year and happy Upstream Innovation Week. Um, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you about bio-based compostable catering disposables. So hopefully you can see my slides now and uh, I'll give you a taster of what I'm going to talk about today. Firstly, I will introduce Vegware and what we do. Then I'll look at why bio-based and compostable materials are interesting, where they do and where they do not fit. They're not magic, they're not perfect for every situation, so let's understand that better. Then I'll look at how they interact with different waste systems, focusing on bio-waste. Then I'm going to talk about a few case studies, so where we have um, a lot of experience in working together with the waste sector, talking about the UK and Italy that have quite different policies. So I'm going to give those examples. And then finally, um, we have a Q&A session with the Plastics Pact Portugal members who are live on, on Zoom. So without further ado, introducing Vegware. We are an Edinburgh company. We're a global company. We are the global specialist in plant-based and compostable food service packaging. We make everything you might need for food to go. Everything we have is made from bio-based materials. Everything is designed for industrial composting. We are, um, obviously, I'm not going to talk about the B word everybody's talking about, but we're very much a European uh, company. We um, have served 70 countries around the world, but we very much feel like a European com um, company. We have our uh, warehouse already functioning for the last year in the Netherlands. So we are um, expecting to service our European friends after January as well as, as we have been recently. Um, I'm very happy to say that we have been growing very fast. Um, this year we are the fastest growing company in Scotland in terms of international sales and just last week it was announced that we are the uh, um, fourth fastest growing private company in Scotland and I think this is um, very much to do with the the real interest in that I'm seeing in the catering world in our materials and what um, the opportunities they can open up. So before I get into the technical nitty gritty subject, 
here's what our products actually look like. So this is to bring it to life. We have um, all sorts of products for food to go for hot, cold, wet, dry. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the same shapes that every caterer needs, but we're reimagining the materials. So it has uh, different impacts on the sustainability of the product before use and after use. But it has to work. It has to function perfectly every time and it has to look good. So we make sure that we have quality products for any caterer to use. And we are very interested, of course, in um, using these different materials. It has been uh, a strange year for everybody and there's been huge, huge ripple effects around every family and every sector. Something that we have seen in our um, customer base is that many caterers have had to increase their use of disposables because of concerns around hygiene and also the ability to help disperse groups of people and not have them gather in one central restaurant. And so, yes, disposables use is increasing at the moment, but um, this is a quote, for example, from Sodexo, who we were working with on a composting project in London. They were very pleased to um, make use of our products to alleviate the environmental impact of that change. I'd just like to um, remind everyone that composting is a form of recycling. Organics recycling is on a par with mechanical recycling in the EU packaging and packaging waste directive. So let's start off with, um, a, a, I think, a graph that's very familiar to everybody in the plastics packed and everyone who's um, as impressed as I am with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So here we have a way of looking at our world, or rather our worlds, uh, plural. So on the left, you have the biosphere, and on the right, you have the mechanosphere. And so every form of activity, we can split into these two um, uh, systems that should be circular, that should be restorative. And so I am very much focusing on the biosphere and both, both journeys are completely valid, need to be done correctly and help materials flow, but they do not mix. And so this is what I'm going to try and get across is that this is the role of bio-based compostable disposables that they can fit in in, uh, in the biosphere and deliver food waste to soil safely with no plastics. So moving on, <clears throat> again, I'm still in the big picture thinking here. Um, we, you know, we are an urbanized society these days all around Europe. It's, it's a real challenge to get the food waste out of cities and back to land. We rely on the land. It's the biosphere where our life happens. We rely on food and, you know, that's the most important thing is healthy soil um, providing our you know, sustaining life for us. So there's some major challenges that we're seeing at the moment. We are lo uh, losing topsoil very fast. Um, and then of course, incinerating food waste um, is, you know, losing, losing those nutrients that could be uh, returning organic carbon to soil. And so what can we do? Of course, there's organic recycling. So by treating food waste, we can generate biogas biomethane, compost, organic carbon, digestate and extracted CO2. And so listed here on the lower, you can see all sorts of very positive impacts here in terms of um, the, the climate. So the most important thing, of course, is that we have to nurture and restore the biosphere. Um, and that only happens if we have clean feedstocks. If the food waste we are capturing is polluted and contaminated with plastics, then that's bad news. So moving on to compostables. First, a warning. They are not magic. They are not perfect in every situation. They are only suited to very specific um, contexts. And that is where um, plastics can Sorry, I'm going to start that sentence again. So we would only recommend compostability in five to eight percent of packaging. We are not 
saying that every last bit of plastic should be bio-based compost compostable, sorry, compostable rather. Um, so for example, the image here I put up is a, a PET water bottle. PET water bottles are a success story um, comparatively in terms of plastics and mechanical recycling. Um, Vegware would never make a water bottle from compostable materials because we don't think there's a point. We think that um, the material that is already used has a recognized and established system and we would not make any problems for that. Where we see the real need is where um, it's the nexus, it's where food and packaging will always, always meet. And um, what I'm telling you here is based on a very interesting report that um, I would recommend, which was um, for the biomass biorefinery network. Um, so here we are. These are the good uses for compostables. So it's always um, an answer to a specific challenge only where packaging and food are always going to meet. So here you can see in this um, UK Plastics Pact graphic, which I think is fantastic. Um, it's food caddy liners, it's the stickers on fruit and vegetables, it's tea bags, coffee pods, ready meal trays, and uh, compostable catering disposables where you can capture those and um, send it to organics recycling, but not elsewhere. So um, let's have a look at the materials that we use at Vegware. Um, we use renewable or lower carbon or recycled or reclaimed materials. Um, and we've got some further information and some links on the side here, but um, there are many clients of ours who enjoy using these products specifically because they're bio-based and they know that they have um, a reduced impact on the manufacture side, um, looking at the materials. Um, everything we have, the fit, complete package, lids, windows, everything is designed for commercial composting, industrial composting. Uh, we do not have any oxo-degradable materials at all. We do not use any conventional plastics. So this is what our range is made of. We've got, oh, let's say 370 different items using these um, modern materials. Everyone knows there's some big changes afoot at the moment. Um, the EU single use plastics directive is um, currently in, this, in the stage that member states are making their own national laws. They have to do that by July next year. Some countries have already stated how they want to um, interpret the directive and others are still discussing it. So um, in the q and I hope nobody asks me two specific questions about this because I don't know all of the answers. It's still in discussion, um, but obviously we're um, following the debate as closely as we can. But broadly speaking, I wanted to give an overview of where it affects catering disposables. So there will be <clears throat> some food service plastics that will be um, under a market res restriction, so uh, banned. So plastic plates, cutlery, straws and stirrers. So with those, you have plant-based and compostable alternatives. Uh, we have paper straws, wooden cutlery, bagasse tableware and wooden stirrers. And I've got that images on the right. Um, one point of interest is that member states are choosing how they interpret um, this section. And some countries, for example, um, Italy, Portugal, and I believe Hungary, um, are deciding what to do about um, bioplastic, so bio-based compostable cutlery and straws. And it's, it's possible that some of these countries will still allow, for example, PLA, CPLA, cutlery and straws. But of course, the details will be um, important for us to see by July. Moving on, of course, oxo-degradable plastics are being banned. And that means that um, people who are currently using bags, straws and cups um, made from oxo-degradable plastics will need to move over. But of course, there are plenty of options. Similarly, there'll be a big shift away from expand, expanded polystyrene, styrofoam, um, and there are alternatives available in um, fibre-based materials. 
So um, I mentioned uh, Portugal and I don't want to uh, try and tell you more than you, you probably know more than, than me, but as I understand it, an overview for people who are listening on, on YouTube that may be from outside Portugal, um, there's a new law that is um, coming in probably for March, potentially extended due to COVID, but um, this broadly encourages reuse. Um, it also allows bio-based and compostable disposables as an alternative where reuse is not possible. Um, there's a similar um, law on bags, which encourages reuse, phases out plastic and allows bio-based and compostable uh, bags. So this tells me that uh, Portugal is taking compostability seriously. Portugal is interested in the opportunities that bio-based and compostable materials can bring and that they are focusing very hard on their bio-waste um, policy. Um, and I find that very exciting, it's an opportunity, and so I'm pleased if, if any of the uh, information I'm sharing today is of use. Let's have a quick look at the standards and logos. So firstly, everybody will familiar, be familiar with the European standard EN 13432. These are the agencies which provide the certification. It's very important that the uh, specific code should be together with the logo. Um, it's a big investment for companies like ours. It's a, it's a significant um, spend, but we believe in having that as a trust mark so that we can build that relationship with the composting sector, with the waste sector. Um, the American standard is um, very, very similar, almost the same as the European standard. And these on the right hand side are the agencies who provide certification to meet that standard. And we operate in 70 countries around the world, so we have a variety um, of both of um, the European and the American standards, depending on the, the demand. Um, so my next slide is going to be a run through of seven different recycling options for compostables. And by re recycling, I'm including organics recycling and mechanical recycling. So first off, we have in-vessel composting. So this is absolutely ideal for our compostable products. And the standard that I mentioned on the previous slide um, looks at um, a 12 week time frame. But in practice, as I'll come on to, it's often quicker in real life. Next, um, there are certain types of wet anaerobic digestion plants which are suited to taking and processing compostables. It's not every single wet AD plant, but if they have a special pre-treatment, um, they might have a certain special type of depackager that they've chosen for their own reasons that can include compostables. They may include a composting phase like a common practice in Italy. Um, in the UK, wet AD is, is um, the most popular type of AD. Um, there are um, other types of AD, however. There's dry anaerobic digestion, and this is a, a slightly different um, form of anaerobic digestion, and it can take in compostables, it can take in garden waste, but it still creates fertilizer and it still creates biogas. Then we have on-site machines. So there's lots of different appliances that are suited for food waste. And there are some specific machines which are suited to also including um, compostable packaging. Um, this can be a, um, a satisfying investment if some a, a business or a college, for example, has some land, they have um, the people to manage this machine and they have a use for compost because that's obviously what you're producing. Um, if you follow the, the link, you can watch the film of a horticultural college in Scotland, which has a rocket composter. They include the used vegware in the waste together with the garden waste and they, um, the students produce compost um, with it. Um, I'm also aware of some commercial food waste collection companies um, who use um, those on those units as the way of processing the waste that they collect. So moving on, 
Um, then there is open windrow composting. This is um, garden waste composting, and it's very common in the USA. It um, processes the, our packaging very successfully, but it is um, in Europe, not suitable for food waste. Um, I'm most familiar with the UK. In the UK, we have the animal byproducts regulations that state that um, food waste can only go to in-vessel composting or anaerobic digestion. And obviously our products are normally covered in food waste. And so therefore they should go to the same treatments. However, in 2018, the um, UK Environment Agency decided that if it's only drinks waste, then it can go to this form of composting, to open window composting. So that is um, obviously an interesting avenue to explore for drinks waste only. Um, moving on. Um, I have two forms of mechanical recycling to mention. Fibre recovery. Um, some paper mills I'm aware of accept PLA lined paper cups and sandwich boxes. So not a solution for the full range and not a solution where there is heavy food contamination. However, um, if a, a particular site has a lot of paper cups, um, then that could be an option. And lastly, mechanical recycling of PLA is possible and um, it would need a large volume just of um, PLA cups, for example. Um, Loop Life Polymers practice this in Belgium and there is um, more of this in the USA as well. Um, otherwise in Europe, it's not very widespread. So I mentioned time frame for composting. Um, EM13432 looks at a 12 week time frame, and I think probably anyone in the composting industry would think, oh my word, that's a very long time. It has to be quicker. So um, that is often longer than our, our products take to break down in practice. We work with a lot of different composting facilities and very often um, they will have their own cycle. They don't make any changes for including our product, but they have a cycle which is six or seven or eight weeks long, some are a bit longer, but it works perfectly um, and there's not an issue. Um, we have also heard reports of an open windrow composting facility that processed our drinks cups in just three weeks. So we know that depending on the process, um, there is the option for faster um, times. I'd also point out a study um, from Wageningen, I hope I've said that right, um, that looked at PLA plant pots. They discovered that they broke down sufficiently in just 11 days. Um, and that is very useful proof to know that that potential is there. However, it comes with a warning because the one problem they found was conventional plastic had been in the mix and that was um, causing a contamination issue. So that to me says that we all share exactly the same challenge. It's behavior change. It's understanding what to put where and why. So that's something that we all have in common in every waste stream. I've got an important number for you, 2%. So 2% of packaging, sorry, this is, this is based on the experiences from Italy. 2% of plastic packaging will be compostable because it's needed to collect and return bio waste to treatment, take it back to soil without plastic contamination. And so this um, makes me see compostable disposables as a vehicle. It's a, it's a lubricant for the system. It's a vehicle for collecting and capturing food waste. If you don't have it, you can't capture pure clean food waste and that's what we need to have healthy soils and therefore a happy biosphere. 1000 kilos of food waste collected would have 20 kilos of compostable packaging and by that it's bio bags, it's bags, uh, supermarket bags, the thin bags for fruit and vegetables, tea bags etc and um, disposables as well because you often have leftover food captured in the compostable products 
that otherwise, if it goes into the general waste bin, you are losing that food waste. So I think this is the real role of compostable disposables in these different formats. It's for capturing food waste, and that is so important for so many different environmental reasons. And here we have some illustrations of that problem. So what happens um, at present? Plastic contamination. If you collect food waste in plastic and if you mix these two, uh, two worlds together, you've got the biosphere and the mechanosphere meeting. They should not. They should not meet. So this is causing a problem. So here we have very typical photographs and it's, it's commonplace. So um, I would recommend to everybody at home to make sure they use bio bags, the compostable um, food waste liners in, the, in their house. And um, there's a report that I linked to at the end, which shows that they have been, um, uh, there's evidence, very strong evidence to show that they are absolutely the best method of capturing food waste. Now, to, until now, I've talked about what happens in the best case scenario. So what can happen to compostables if they go into um, the right types of um, waste streams? But let's look at what happens um, elsewhere in a less than best case scenario. So in general waste, um, in incineration, um, the fact that our materials are bio-based is the most important bit here. It's not that they're compostable, that's not interesting if they're not being composted, we're looking at the fact that they're plant materials. So in incineration, um, PLA produces more energy than newspaper, wood or food waste. And very importantly, they do not emit volatile gases. Then in landfill, they remain inert and do not generate methane. And on the right, you can see, and down the bottom, you can see some, some links for further understanding. Moving on, um, people often worry about what happens if compostable um, for example, PLA gets into plastics recycling. Well, PLA does have its own uh, near infrared spectrum, so it can be recognised by optical sorting in sorting technology. However, of course, bioplastics are a very tiny proportion of all packaging and it's not yet economical to sort. However, if you think of a sorting facility that's picking out the, the plastics that it desires, for example, if it's looking, actively looking to take um, PET bottles, it would not take um, a PLA um, item because it has a different um, near infrared spectrum, it has a different identity. And so um, thankfully that is um, some cause for reassurance. Um, there's a few studies that I've linked to here that um, I'm sure um, the participants can get the slides afterwards, that uh, up to low levels, there's no reduction in quality if these bioplastics get into traditional plastics recycling. But for us, the most important thing is avoiding all contamination. So we advise our clients that if they do not have access to the right kind of industrial composting or some of the other treatments that I've mentioned, they should put it in general waste and the, the benefits of using plant-based materials are still absolutely valid. Um, so we, we like to work in a joined up way. We like to work with our clients, with the composting facilities. We, we want to make sure that the journey of our product is well thought out and we interact with all of the people in that chain. Um, and so now I'd like to give a couple of examples, two different countries with very different policy environments. We um, are from the UK. So um, I, I know the, um, the setup here very well and I want to explain uh, what it's like here. There is currently no joined up policy on waste and compostables in the UK, although that is currently under development with a lot of um, work, detailed work for the waste and resources strategy. Um, but everywhere in the UK, the, the 
systems are different, every facility is slightly different, and so it's a, a patchwork, it's a huge variety. So what that has meant in practice for us is that we have had to be very proactive and I'm very proud of the, the inroads, the advancements that we have made. So um, back in 2010, there was only a trade waste collection for a business using vegware to get their products composted in Aberdeen, just one city. And today, um, after 10 years of working hand in hand with the waste sector and getting more and more partners with collectors, with facilities, um, we now have um, trade collections in 55 of the UK's biggest cities. That covers 72% of the UK's urban population. For people not in those areas or with just a small amount, there's also post back services. So if people have just a box full of used vegware, then they can um, send it back through these courier services. The image on the left is from our friends at Paper Round, who are one of the companies that we work closely with. And the link there takes you to a webinar that we held um, explaining the um, system that we work, the project in London composting. But I'll tell you a bit about it now. Um, we worked at 12 different offices, mainly offices, very large, um, large scale sites in London, mainly through contract caterers at um, large corporate offices at 12 different places so that together with Paper Round, we could trial how we should approach these collections and to get the best outcomes for minimizing contamination. So we had a, um, a month of concerted communications efforts um, and they did a waste audit at the beginning and at the end. So here we see images of at the top left, we have um, a launch day in the restaurant area. In the middle, you can see a poster that was displayed around the restaurant area, also on the digital screens. Um, you can see we have a, a virtual reality film that people could watch. Um, and then you can see the, uh, the bin signage that we helped um, uh, put together. So a month of this, together with um, guidance, emails and other activities using the communications channels at the sites, um, showed these results. So before, over on the left, this was the first audit before any of the activities. And you can see that the pink, the vegware, plus the brown, food waste, together, that makes 49% target material. So 49% what they want, 51% not what they want. And so then at the end of that month of activity, you can see on the right how it changed. So it was now 80% target material. Um, and so that was um, a big um, tick in favor of um, communications campaigns. It showed us how important it was that everybody understood um, how they should, which bin they should put the products in. Um, this is information about the composting facility it goes to. Um, and so I'm not going to read all of this out, but um, the main thing is that the total length of composting there is seven weeks and it is quality compost. They pass the um, quality protocol um, called PAS 100. Um, moving on to Italy. Italy is very, very different from the UK. They have had 10 years of a fantastic bio waste policy that really brings together um, all the elements that you need. And so I'll explain a little about that. Um, they have uh, compost access um, to uh, bio waste everywhere. You'll see these um, nice um, organico bins. And we have a lot of clients in Italy who, who really understand the point of um, compostable materials. So here's how it works. The government has mandated that all bags need to be compostable um, and food waste need to be uh, have to be um, has to be collected in compostable liners and that avoids the issues that I showed you in the pictures before. Then um, to do with cohesion really it's a very coherent policy 
one company manages all the waste waste streams for each region or city and they do awareness raising campaigns it's all very clear it's um, they have a lot of direct contact with citizens they send leaflets public meetings etc so people really understand what they should do with their waste then the treatment method is very interesting they have a lot of anaerobic digestion plants but these include a composting phase um, and um, at the bottom you'll see Italy collects 66% of all EU bio waste so that goes to show that a really well thought out policy like this can really work and so countries like Portugal who are evaluating how to meet the um, the European directive on um, on bio waste for 2024 I, I think Italy is a really interesting policy environment to look at. Um, there's a couple of other countries just to mention very briefly. Um, in Ireland, there is a new um, certification um, from the, um, it's called Cray, which is their association for, um, for composters. Um, and this is trying to build consumer awareness so that this brown tick that you might see on a product, you can know instantly that that will go in the brown bin in Ireland brown bins are mandatory for householders and for businesses and composting is the dominant method there so um, our uh, EM1342 certified products can go uh, into the composting systems there and that gives brands a much better story you know there's been so many um, negative headlines about recycling and linking to brands but here we have on the right, for example, Tesco's, um, whose coffee brand Smoking Bean is in a compostable cup. It has that brown tick on it. And then they have that happy story that their consumers can just put it in their brown bin at home. Um, just to mention um, Hungary briefly, that we have started working together with a very forward thinking um, expert company in, in composting called uh, ProfiComp and they have a composting facility just outside Budapest and are starting up collections for businesses there. So it's um, in many different countries all around Europe that there's real interest in this solution. Um, and I'm just going to end on a few links that I would recommend um, today or yesterday, I believe um, there's a new article out. The BBIA is our trade association in the UK, the bio-based and biodegradable industries association. But this web address here is absolutely full of very useful reports I'd recommend. And also if anybody's looking for some good weekend or Christmas film viewing, then Kiss the Ground is absolutely a, a must see. And that is everything from me. So I'd like to thank everybody for, um, for listening today. Um, and wish everybody a far better 2021 than, than this year. And, and that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Lucy, for this uh, complete presentation and all the case studies that were really interesting. I'll now open the Q&A session. So please, okay, we just have one question here. Uh, Suzanne, I'm going to activate your sound. Just a minute. I believe it's... Okay, yes. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, Lucy. Thank you for your presentation. So I'm Susanna Fonseca from an environmental NGO. So some of the things that I'm going to say, probably you, have, you are, have already heard. Um, but uh, so we, we're not uh, against biodegradable. It's not that the issue. And I, and I think in your presentation, you did a very balanced uh, approach to it, saying that there are some uses where it makes sense to use um, biodegradable materials. But uh, our uh, let's say our concern is that in so many situations, uh, biodegradables end up being used as an excuse to maintain the single-use uh, approach, let's say. I mean, even some of the examples you presented, they, they clearly are on that line, I mean, in the, in the coffee shops. And, and so we, we're not uh, at all against using, for, for example, for the bio waste, you know, bags and everything, or even for coffee cups, I mean, uh, or tea bags. I think there is a, a role there. <laughs> um, it, they might, it might help solve a problem. But in other situations, and we see it also on, on the news, so many 
um, new sayings, a company no longer uses plastic, but it, for example, because it, it, it's, now, it's now using some kind of other material, bio-based material or something. But the truth is that they are continually producing waste and there's an impact uh, associated with it. And uh, uh, so for us, it's really important that uh, the new legislation that will come out, the transposition of the super directive, et cetera, it's clearly, clearly um, indicates the, the place that should be uh, the one where biodegradables have a role, I would say, and it should be narrow. <laughs> uh, because we are afraid that if, if there's no such uh, regulation, it will be difficult for uh, um, for countries to 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 countries companies not to to use biodegradables because it's so much easier to use the single use approach than to go, for example, for reuse, which is a more structural change. Um, so this is more of a comment in terms of a question. So an area that we are also concerned, and uh, just recently there was a, even a. a an article, a scientific article coming out, is about the toxicity of the materials and the the, the comparison between the the, plas the fossil fuel plastics and other materials, and they the results are not so positive for for uh, plant based materials, bioplastics, etc. I would like to know in your case of your company what kind of uh, tests have you done? So not, not so much about the polymer, but all the additives that in many cases are uh, uh, used also in the process of it. So if you could tell us something more about it, I would be happy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so firstly, responding to your, your initial comment, what you're saying is absolutely what's happening. You know, that is the single use plastics directive. So there's, um, there's a need for every member state to have consumption reductions there's going to be a huge awareness uh, raising activity on um, on encouraging reuse so that what you say is absolutely going to be happening over the next few years. Um, there are some circumstances where disposables do fit in, but as you say, um, it, it's an alternative. So it's a it's a backup. And we often see clients that we're working with need that combination. So they have their reusable items and that's where they they put a lot of you know effort and and you know for the implementation but then as a backup where sometimes they for you know if they don't if they aren't able to plumb in a dishwasher on every floor of a large office building that's already been built you know there's lots of circumstances where disposables um, are operationally much simpler or maybe there's um, issues around you know water uh, water use for dishwashing in Mediterranean countries. Maybe there's the economic factor of the you know, the staff time needed for um, collecting and washing reusables. But you're absolutely right that you know this is the the big push is towards reuse, and we are absolutely um, in agreement that disposables should be in in a certain context where they're needed. But we think it's quite um, important that they should be allowed as an alternative where not possible. So for example, what Italy is recommending is that um, they have a, a guide recommendations for safe and hygienic dishwashing of reusable crockery and utensils. And it says exactly, you know, the temperatures that are needed for the pre-wash, etc. So it says all the different circumstances for good washing. And if that's not possible, then um, disposables are allowed and those should be compostable. So for example, that to me seems like a very sensible approach that you encourage reuse, but where it's not possible, allow compostables as an alternative and to have a sensible waste system in, in place as well. Um, then moving on to your second question, we have a whole variety of different um, certifications. So obviously, you mentioned the toxicity so there's ecotoxicity is one of the tests in certification for compostability um, and so that's you know uh, that's, a, that's a given for all of our all of our products that they meet that criteria um, in addition we have food safety certification for our products as well and that you know take cares takes care of any other issues and you know obviously our our 
food safety, client health, environmental health is paramount, paramount importance. So um, obviously we meet the, you know, the, the reach standards and so on. Um, but this is, um, you know, an ongoing um, uh, process that as we develop new products and we un have developed understanding of different materials that we investigate those fully, but we always make sure that we have laboratory testing to, to make sure that our materials do comply with the current standards. Okay, thank you, Lucy, for your comments. Um, I ask if there is uh, more questions for Lucy, if anybody wants to, to talk. Uh, we have here one comment on the chat box. I don't know if you want to comment back. Uh, just me. Which? Okay, I'll read it for you. Uh, the composting plant of Lipar, it, uh, it, uh, it is a waste management system here in Portugal, has a relatively fast process, 14 days plus 14 days. We have tested different materials certified as compostable, including PL, PLA from different brands. We have seen little or no degradation in most cases. I have seen a report from Wagningen, not sure if the one you mentioned, that had misleading conclusions. They described partial, uh, partial degradation of materials with a composting process and concluded that with multiple recirculation cycles, the materials would eventually be totally degraded. Uh, degraded. Um, so, I, I totally understand the need for composting facilities to um, have a fast throughput of material in order to have their income. Um, however, I would also say that, well, I would put the question, is that making really good compost? Because it's often, I'm not a composter. I'm not an expert in composting. I know some about com something about composting, but I'm sure there's many people who know a lot more than me. Um, but I, I have been told that um, the economic pressure on composting facilities is not good for the quality of compost. And so really what we should be moving towards is putting better value on compost, putting a better value on quality soil and allowing composting facilities more time so that they can produce better compost that can put more nutrients back to soil and so um, I don't want to comment specifically on exactly how the um, the Wageningen um, uh, report was carried out because that's online and people can read it themselves and make their own um, judgments but um, I would I would say that a shift that we definitely need is um, I'm just saying reading your second comment that you have the best class compost certified for organic farming um, well, we'd love to send you some um, some material for you to, to look at. Um, it, it may not work with every single type of composting facility. So that's why we do trials. That's why we work together with composters. And that's why, for example, in the UK, we've built up a network knowing which facilities can take our products and which facilities cannot. And then we work with the collectors that we know are taking our products to the correct facilities. So I have a lot of um, respect for individual facilities that have their own process. And if they don't want our products, then that's, that's their choice. But um, I, what I'm trying to put across in my presentation is that there, there are options. There are a lot of facilities that do work successfully with these materials and they are worthy of investigating and trialing, that's all. Thank you so much, Lucy, for your uh, answers and comments. Uh, they were very interesting. Uh, we are now reaching the final of our session. Uh, so um, thank you so much, Lucy, for your great and complete presentation uh, and this Q&A session. Uh, I'll just switch a little bit to Portuguese. Obrigada a todos pela vossa presença nesta sessão e na Semana Upstream Innovation Week. Uh, foi um prazer contar convosco e com a vossa participação. Muito obrigada. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you. Mm -hmm.